This is the Misdirected Mark Podcast, a podcast about gaming, game mastering, and entertaining you, our listeners. We are explicit, and you have been warned, and I'd like to thank Mike Willard for letting us use his music on our show. Now let's pick up those mics and get on with this thing. Oh yes, let us pick up the mics and get on with this thing. As we continue our 101 jamming advice, Phil will update us on his road to recovery. We will hit up the social media depository, and then we'll go into the after show. And as always, my name is Chris. And I'm Phil. And I'm Old Man Logan. You are, in fact, Old Man Logan, and you are, in fact, Phil. So, I guess, you know, let's just jump right into it. I mean, we're going to do Jamming 101 Part 2, so... Technically 102. 102, I guess. I guess. Uh, it's still 101. Semantics. It's semantics. No, that's a different class. Whatever. Mm, that's true. <laughs> Ethics, <laughs> philosophy. I heard a really good thing, politically, I suppose. Wow, we're going to go political for no, a second. Really um, somebody said, if you want to be a politician, you should live in a liberal state for, like, three years, and then you should live in a conservative state for three years, take an ethics class, and then run for office. Sure. I right. like it. Seems legit. Experience a little bit of both sides. Yeah. Uh huh. Absolutely. Mean, yeah. Yeah. I got some things. For, I got some. I mean, why not? Well, I mean, with, I, listen, the idea was nice, like back in the, you know, back in the dawn of democracy to be like, well, anyone could be a politician, but yeah. maybe there actually should be a little upfront training before yes. you start kind of wielding that power around. I agree. Just saying. Well, with that bit of political. That's all we're getting on political today. Yeah. Except maybe um, how you might want to, like, you know, patron us in the future and what we'll do for you yeah. we'll get to that in announcements yeah. we're gonna undercut the president <laughs> well with that uh what's going on phil um well uh, i'll do the arm stuff really quick um i had uh i had the fun uh time last week of having the uh staples removed oh yeah from my arm ka-chink 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 uh yeah if you've never seen dermal staples um they're exactly <laughs> what they sound like and um the mm. removal tool is a um, kinder, gentler uh, version of the office thingy. Yep. Um, it's actually pretty, it actually looks more like a cuticle trimmer. Yeah. And it, it just bends the, um, it just bends the uh, staple and then yep. they just kind of pop out. Bends it back out so that it's almost straight and then it pulls out easier. Yeah. yeah so cool. they, they t- so the doctor and the nurse tag teamed me. The nurse Ooh. did my arm. <laughs> oh, not, double it's not, it's not, it's not the after show that. I can't do that yet. <laughs> No, what happened was the doctor came in to see me and he starts talking to me about um, what I can do, what I can't do with the arm. And the nurse is just sitting there like clink, 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 clink. I mean, there's 43 of them. So oh, yeah, but that's classic distraction. Yeah, it was perfect. Technique, yeah. And, and, and the removal was perfectly fine. After she removed them, she took an antiseptic <laughs> to wipe everything. And that's 86 little tiny holes yep. that I was acutely aware of for 30 seconds <laughs> when I hissed at her. Like... <laughs> Like a cat? Well, you know, after after breaking it and, and you know, having it, uh, like, you know, not set for three days in the surgery, like, there's a certain amount of pain I could tolerate. When she hit it, I was like, like, yeah. oh, like man. I just made this, like, little hissing sound at her. And then I was like, no, it's fine. Tape it up. We're all good here. We're all good here. <laughs> so the good news is, the good news is, um, it's, uh, it's doing well. Now, I, I forgot because I showed you guys, but we're talking to people on the, we're talking to people in the chat room and, and other listeners. So they do a post-op x-ray, right? Like I come, I come into the office and they're like, oh, go over, get an x-ray and then come back. So I get an x-ray. Now I saw the break. You've seen the break. Oh, yeah. Right. It's, it's not pretty. It was heinous. Yeah. And um, when they said it to me after the surgery, they're like, yeah, we, we put two screws in and a plate. That's not exactly accurate. No. <laughs> when, I saw the, when I saw the x-ray, I'm like, holy shit. What they mean by two screws is I think they put two screws through the fracture. Yeah. They put nine more screws in to hold the plate in place. Yep. Um, that plate runs the length of my humerus. Yep. Like, it's like a foot long. Like, I got a lot of hardware now. I also now have a card that says I have a, a metal medical implant. Yep. So that You're I can, a card-carrying member of the I, setting off the yeah, alarm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm officially, like, I, I am potentially setting off TSA stuff now. Potentially? Uh, because it's titanium. It oh, okay. may or may not. Yeah. Like, on a body scan, it absolutely will show up. Um, but, like on, a, um, like, on a metal detector walkthrough, may or may not. So, so any, when you die, who gets the titanium? Uh, the earth. 
I mean, I, I feel like I guess they'll fish it out of the ashes. Depends on if he's going burial or yeah. cremation. Like, yeah. like I mean, like if you die before me, I mean, no, I figure cre- you should probably give that stuff to your kids because they could sell it. But you know, yeah, great. <laughs> I got some other things they could have. The titanium, I don't know, but oh, medical man. grade titanium. Anyway, um, <laughs> so anyway, that was, um, and they also uh, made me stop using my sling. That was the other thing. The doctors like stop using your sling. Actually, start using your arm. Um, nothing heavier than a cell phone in your hand, it's, no weight bearing. It's fun to go out with Phil these days because he can't buckle his seatbelt. Uh, if I'm the passenger in the car, I can't. Yeah. If I drive, I can. Oh, there you go. Um, which I did. I went driving um, on Sunday and it was fine. I can get in and put my seatbelt on. But if I'm the passenger, then yes, you have to put my seatbelt on. You have to click it for me. And then more importantly, you have to remember to unclick it so I can get out of the car. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I sit in the car looking awkward. Anyway, I did that. Um, I watched some more TV. Uh, my daughter's birthday party was this weekend, so my parents were in town. That's um, kind of a wet blanket for getting anything done, like once my parents are in town. Um, so I didn't do very much. Sunday, um, we did our session zero for Urban Shadows. Yeah, we did. That was sure actually did. a lot of fun. I really like the, um, really liked the character that I came up with. Um, and I was able to write on my playbook a lot more than I thought I would. Um, my arm did a good job and I was actually able to fill out most of my playbook. I actually filled out all my playbook and extra notes and stuff. So mm-hmm. I, was, I was pleased with that. Um, and then yesterday I conquered my to-do list. So if you know me and I'm big into productivity, being down for like a month means that like all of my to-do lists, all of my system was completely blown out. So I very slowly over the course of a couple hours sitting at my desk, uh, put all of that back together. And um, got everything wrangled, and I feel a lot better. Like, I know what's being handled, I know what's not being handled, so I feel good. And I started um, prepping uh, for my Tales from the Loop game that's on Sunday. Very cool. Which I'm, uh, which I'm psyched about, because I'm, one, I'm very much ready to go back to uh, doing some GMing. Mm-hmm. And Tales is, a, Tales is a pretty easy game for me to GM again. I don't actually have to, um, I don't roll dice I don't actually have to write that much, so should be pretty uh, should be pretty comfortable. So anyway, I'm doing better. I'm still out of work. Um, I can't say I'm too sad about that because I think Altered Carbon drops on Friday. Yeah, it so does. so I'm you gonna. May, you may want to watch the Twitters at midnight Eastern as when it pops soon as up. that mother drops. I'm I'm logging in. Me, me and Phil may be watching episodes and tweeting about them. Uh huh. Yeah, I think I'll be up for a while on Friday. Uh, at least yeah. get the first two episodes in or something <laughs> yeah. before I go to bed. That means Bob will probably be in on that too. We're all just going to tweet storm. Yeah, that, that could be a thing. Some altered carbon. I mean, I, I love, I loves me altered I, you carbon. Will, you will almost never see me live tweet a program because I would have to pause tweet and then fire it up again. <laughs> I can't pay attention to the tweet and the show. Yeah, we'll see how I actually do with that because I, I'm pretty, I'm ready to be pretty mesmerized. Like I, I just, I want to like soak the whole thing in. So there might be a tweet later in the evening that's yeah. like, oh, holy shit, it was so good, so good. I, I read a, a review that basically said, not really a review, but it was a kind of a commentary that Netflix is basically going all in with their their new philosophy and it's it's a bloody, violent thing that, you know, this is probably the state of things that's going to come from Netflix from here on out. And it's like, what I the one I actually saw, which I liked, was like, <laughs> this story is really good, but it's too violent. And I was like, oh, then they really actually yes. did capture the essence of this book. <laughs> I'm like, perfect. I'm like, oh, that that that's right because this book is really violent. Sure is. In fact, I'm kind of hoping that I'm going to find a particular episode. Yeah, baby. There should be a whole episode dedicated to one part of that book. Um, anyway, <laughs> I'm, uh, sorry. The chat room caught me off guard there. That was yeah. funny. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm really psyched about it. So that's, uh, that's me, man. Chris, I, Chris, you played it. You know what? I'm going to go to Bob cause you played a metric shit ton of games. I'm going to go to Bob <laughs> and fair. then you can come back and well, you can come back and, and finish it out. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be quick and then we'll get to Chris. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, psyched about it. Arthur Carbon. Wow. Um, earlier today. Uh, Rob Abrazado uh, gave me a little schooling on the Twitters. He gave me the um, the link to the um, Merriam-Webster definition of reduction because we were talking about Phil's arm. They were doing a, a whatever, whatever reduction. An open an, reduction. An open reduction. And I was like, that seems odd that, you know, it's like they're not making it smaller. 
but reduction has like six different definitions and two of them are about reconnecting things and putting them back together. Yeah. So wow, look at that. Just for medical terms, a closed reduction is like if you break your leg and they pull your leg to get the bones back Mm -hmm. together and then put it in a cast. Um, an open reduction is when you put a one foot incision (laughs) through, (laughs) through your arm, um, and, and then just go in and, you know, work like, you know, auto mechanics in there. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah. So I learned something there. So that's good. You know, you're never too old to learn something. There's your tip for the days, kids. Um, and thank you, Rob Abrazado, for yeah. clearing up reduction. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Character creation for Urban Shadows, man. That was that was a really good time. We've got a really interesting batch of characters. I think that game is going to be fun. And locations. And things and going on in the city already. And, yeah. It's, that's going to be cool. I'm, I'm playing digging, a specter, I'm so I'm a ghost. I am a I am a dead person. You sure are. <laughs> I'm the demon. <laughs> yep. Chris likes my character already. Oh yeah. I do. I like all the characters and how I can see them interacting yes. and the things that are going on in the city. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. Yeah, it should be a lot um, of fun. Yeah, and um, I watched uh, Kong Skull Island a few days ago. How many helicopters? I mean, oh my god. <laughs> Let's just say that they go from a ship that can carry four helicopters to suddenly twelve helicopters flying through the air, and I'm like, where'd the other ones come from? Anywho. Entertaining film though. Kong was really well done. I thought the you know the the giant creature fights and stuff all you know very well done. Yeah, I mean it looks like a giant gorilla. You know so good there, good stuff. And you know um, 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 I suddenly can't remember his name. Oh God, Loki Hiddleston. Uh, uh, Tom Hiddleston. Tom Hiddleston. Yeah, he was really good. So yeah, good, good stuff, good stuff, and. Um, yeah. I'm uh I'm good there. Chris, how about you, man? Okay, let's talk. So Do the here thing. we go. I'm pretty sure that Ange is in the chat room, and I know Jerry's in the chat room. Uh-huh. They both are. So I was at running gag this past um weekend and I had a freaking blast. So uh, I got there early on Friday. I had lunch at a Polish Euro- Polish Euro Bistro with Ange and um L and Miko. Or Mirko. I always forget. Somebody will have to correct me on that. I just, it slipped my, my mind. And Doug. And that was really lovely. Like, we had pierogies and kielbasa. It was fantastic. Um, then I got to play a whole bunch of games. I don't usually play a bunch of games. So I played uh, 5th edition D&D. I played this really fun adventure that is very, very Chris Nizak in style. Uh, the Game Master was okay. Uh, the, the game was tons of fun. I actually got to play with um, with Alana, another one of Andrew's friends, who's uh, pretty cool. And we had a good, good old time. Then I got to play The Strange. It was a uh, steampunk London, and that was a really fun time with the players. And I got to play with another one of Angie's friends, Woody, who's a really cool guy. Uh, and and the, some of the other people at the table were pretty great too. The game master was subpar. <laughs> that was unfortunate. So, but uh, we still had a really good time with the game. It was it got bad when um, after the game, some of the players were like, "So DM two point looking at me." That that made me sad. I was like, oh, "I didn't mean to be like that," uh, but we still had a great time. Then. I was uh, hanging out with Jerry till like two or three in the morning. So he was very kind and let me, uh, let me crash it in his room for the weekend. And we were just sitting around chatting. It was, it was tons of fun. Uh, then in the morning I got to play dusk city outlaws with, uh, Jen Adcock running it. And Cindy Moore was there from Lake effect gaming. Uh, by the way, Jerry is also part of Lake effect gaming. So, uh, Dust City Outlaws is pretty much the best heist game I've ever played. I love the mechanics of that game. So for those people who are not familiar with Dusty Outlaws, we're going to take a second and talk about this game. You are part of a crew, and you are usually part of a uh, some sort of faction in town, uh, be it the uh, the Circle or the Mummers or the uh, the Vespers, who are like they're like a bunch of people who are noble-ish, but they don't like nobles. Mummers are obviously easy to figure out. The Circle is kind of like a bunch of Russians. Uh, there's the family that's obviously a, a, the Italian mafia, and this is a fantasy, a, a low magic fantasy world that feels a lot like Venice, the scent, this the city that you're playing in. So. You get your get you get your job, whatever your job is. We are going to rob the um the king's tax money from an iron like an armored gondola. So it was like an uh, armored truck heist, but from an armored gondola. And then we got 4 days to figure out how we were going to do this. So what you do then is you take day night cards, you lay them out on the table in sequence for 4 days worth of stuff. And then every day or every sequence, every segment you get to, get to, as a group, choose to either do a planning phase 
or a legwork phase. And there's another phase called a drama phase that we never really got into. I'm not really sure how that works. I imagine it's something that the game master can insinuate or when something really wrong goes, wrong happens, like you can you get one of those. But um, a planning phase is legitimately set a 15 minute timer and go. And you as a crew get 15 minutes to plan out what you want to do. At the end of that 15 minutes, that segment is over and you flip the card and you move on to the next segment. And then a legwork phase is that everyone gets to kind of take lead to do a thing in in a scene to like gather information or get supplies or do it like the stuff that you see in Leverage or in Ocean's Eleven, like the, the two brothers building a robot or whatever it is or yeah, yeah stuff like that. Or uh, Bernie Mac going and getting a bunch of security <laughs> cards. Vans. Yeah, stuff like that, right? I like, love that. That's a legwork scene. So, um, and then once again, you flip the card. Now, every time a scene, uh, uh, a segment goes by, the game master gets heat equal to the number of players. And they can spend that heat to do things like create a major complication, do, use a plot twist, cause all kinds of little trouble for the players. So the game master is still constantly kind of messing with your shit as you're trying to plan out this heist, like you see in pretty much every heist movie ever. And then once all the segments are done, you have to pull off the heist. And uh, man, the last thing that happened is uh, Jen had 20 heat, 23 heat technically, and she pulled a major plot twist on us right at the last second that we couldn't do anything about at that point. And she put a bomb on the boat from a bunch of anarchists. So then we had to deal with the fact that there was a bomb on this armored uh, armored gondola that was going to wreck a good chunk of the neighborhood. And we had to, we, like, if it got jostled or if it got, you know, dropped or whatever, it would just kind of go off. And we're like, well, no, now we got to deal with that on the fly. Um, it was amazing. I, uh, I really loved that game quite a bit. I really want to get my hands on it and play it. Um, that I won't talk too much about any other games that I played like I just did about that one, but that, that Dust City Outlaws is the shit. And Sean Merwin will agree with me. Dust City Outlaws is kind of the shit. Uh, Eldritch Horror Legacy with uh, Jane Calvert. And, and Cindy also played that game with me too and some other folks. So we, we had a really good time playing that. We, uh, we got beat around the head by Yig for a long time. <laughs> and uh, and there, you do. Right? So there's this, weird, there's this weird thing about playing Eldritch Horror. Like, I like playing Eldritch Horror and Arkham Horror games like that, like cooperative games, because oh, yeah. I like to swear at the game. Right, I'm like fuck this game, like this right. game, stupid game, you know stuff like that. Except the first time I did it, Jane was like, "It's really not stupid. It's okay because it works like this." And I'm like, "Oh, I'm sorry, Jane. I didn't mean it like that. That's just how I kind of play these games." I'm not insulting the game. But, I just have to, you know, curse the person who's curse the thing that's screwing us. Over. Correct, right? Like, I mean, that's that's. Yeah, I like to do that. So then, o- over the course of the rest of the game, I, I, whenever I would swear at it, and we would all make the joke of like, "He's only talking about the game, Jane, not about you." <laughs> Except when her legacy, uh, when Jane's legacy rules came into play, then I'm like, "Screw you, Jane. That one's your fault." And she's like, "Totally on me," and I love it. <laughs> I'm like, "All right." <laughs> so, Somebody uh, should have said language. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> uh, Mo Tusa knows in there. He's like, "Yeah, like swearing at board games, fucking co-ops, cheat worse than video games." I said a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> oh man never gonna live that one down <laughs> anyways uh then I, got, I played in a larp a full larp i have never played through a full uh larp before like yeah it was really cool it was a freeform larp um, all the people were really great players the person who put the larp together was l um one of Angie's friends and uh miko was uh, her uh, partner husband i'm not sure um i know they live together in new york city uh it was great. It was called the Voyage of the SS Luminary, and we were on a space cruise. A bunch of interesting rich people uh, on a space cruise. I was playing a musician who went double titanium record uh, with with my albums, and you know, there was stuff going on. But I mean, I just played a character for like two and a half hours. It was pretty great. But the the thing that I really enjoyed about the LARP was um, the first thing that that L did is she explained all like the rules that there weren't really many rules, but like some of the other things like, um, how it was kind of work. And then she was like, safety is the most important thing. We do not touch people. We do not do all these things. We want people to be comfortable. And then she led us through a guided meditation, which was really fascinating. And it really calmed me down and, uh, let me like take a breath and get into character. And then we played. That's cool. And it was pretty amazing. I, I would really hope like, not really a LARPer, right? Like me, I'm, that's the second LARP I've ever really been a part of. And it was a, a wonderful experience. Uh, I suppose, and then I, uh, and then, so that was, that was, uh, that was Saturday night. And then uh, I stayed up till like way too late, four in the morning with, um, with Ange 
and uh, Alana and Jerry was there for a while, and then um, Angie's friend TJ came by, and we sat up till like four in the morning just talking. It was it was a wonderful time. And then the next morning I played Cthulhu Wars, and then I uh, scattle, skedaddled, played Cthulhu Wars with a uh, with a uh, with uh, my friend Mel, and we had a really good time playing that game. I won. I was the King in Yellow. It was hilarious. Nice King in Yellow. It's it's like playing Risk with big elder gods. Yeah. Except the the King in Yellow shtick is to not fight anybody and to corrupt the entire world. So you just run around using this corruption move as much as you can. Uh, it's Cthulhu Wars is a clever game. Like I have to say that if you get a chance to play that game, I really, really quite enjoy it. It's actually really cool that it is a cool game because um, there's so much flash to it. As in, those minis are amazing uh -huh. and all that. That, like you know, you could run into the trap of like, hey, this game looks amazing, but it kind of plays meh. So it's actually really cool that it both looks amazing. And actually, is fun to play. So the reason that it's really good to play is when the, the factions all play very differently. That's neat. Um, the way that you play the game is like when you take an action. Yeah. It costs you some amount of power that you've accumulated, but once you take that action, you still have power left in your thing. It just goes to the next person, and you just keep going around. So it's never like risk where somebody takes all of their turn. Yeah. Like it's just constantly going around the table. So it makes the game flow a lot better. Well, that's neat. Yeah. Cool. Um. So. So the moral of running gag is if you go to running gag, you find Ange and you find her friends and you play games with them because they're all pretty much amazing gamers and amazingly cool people. That what? is that is the the moral of the story when it comes to running gag. It, it, isn't that also like the moral of the story to Origins and a few other places where Ange goes? Well, you know that's true also, right? But find we, yeah. Ange, but the, and but the thing is, is like we're all at Origins too. Yeah. So I mean, like, there's actually you find Ange and her friends, or you find us and our friends, and you play games with us. Correct. Or we all just merge into like one correct big one giant conglomerate exactly. of people. I mean, there might be like a hundred of us that all know each other at Origins this year. It's going to be pretty cool. Maybe more. Yeah, I, I'm psyched. We need to talk more about cool things to cool yeah. things we could do at Origins. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I went to Soup Fest. That was cool. So there was like 60 different places selling soup at the convention center. I had a really good time there. Uh, I had a a beef on wax soup and a pizza soup. Interesting. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, and they were pretty good. And then Urban Chow Session Zero. And that's pretty much it. Cool. See, told you you had a lot. I did have a lot. <laughs> I did. I had a lot to say. Do a real quick correction and apology. Yeah. Um, PK Sullivan was the one that schooled me on the reduction. Apologies for uh, getting. I somehow cross linked him with Rob Abrazado for a second there. I and mean, they both have beards. I don't know. Whatever it was. <laughs> Apologies that I got it wrong, and yes, PK was the uh, was the one who schooled me, and uh, so there we go. I got to admit, it's not a hard it's not a hard leap to imagine uh, PK being all knowledgeable about that kind of nope, stuff. No, not yeah, me neither. Very sharp guy. Yeah, yep. he really is. Mm -hmm. um, okay, a couple of announcements. First off, I just found out that Mo Tusino, if you're coming to Origins, he uh, he booked the place that we were at last year, the the video game joint, the yeah. bar. Uh, he, he's got that booked for us already for this year. So if you uh, if yeah. you're gonna go, I mean, I should start a thread at some point in time. I mean, I really should. It's about February. It's time to get this stuff. Organized. Yeah, yeah. So it's time for us. To, well, time for us internally to start figuring out like, like how many events and, we're doing, yeah. and, like panels that we're doing, and games that we're running and such. I would love if we could get a decent. Um, I don't know. We're probably too new to do it, but I would love if we could get a, a small room of like four or five tables and just be like misdirected Mark runs shit for you that'd be cool that I, be I mean nice. i don't know what it would take to do that with origins but i'll find out yeah i mean it'd be neat because then we could all run our stuff together we could, could put the banner up in the room could you uh could you put a note in Ding. thank you for me to do that appreciate it yeah i will slack that i mean i i see you know i i see mo like oh my god i planned <laughs> something before phil i mean let, let's recognize phil's been down for a month like <laughs> Phil's got you a all had arm. a chance to catch up. Oh, oh, it's so cute. Phil feels Phil feels so like like it's not my fault. I can't plan. I've been broken. Yeah. Oh, I oh. gave you guys a month to catch up. I'm coming up now. I'm gonna come up fast. Oh, that's good. I would totally hang out in the misdirected market. Yeah. Oh, that would be a cool. The name misdirected for it. game market. Yeah. I just think it'd be neat. Like, I mean, we could just have like um, we could do our own mini version of um, we could do our own mini version of um, games on demand. Thank you. I got just, you. Like, you know, misdirected Mark on demand, like come play some Hydra hackers with Phil. Come some play Justice, some dungeon like, world with Chris or some sequence yeah. with Chris. I, I would be totally yeah, down. Yeah, wouldn't that, that. I mean, that'd be cool. Come play some circle of six with old man Logan. Yeah. Yeah. You should play old, right. You should play circle of six. And by origins, hopefully play some, uh, bot battle bedlam. Oh, well, bot battle and bedlam. circle of six by origins. You'll be able to you just be go able on to drive through cards, cards and I hope. buy a set. Yeah. Uh, other announcement. So, 
if you are a patron of ours, starting next time we do an episode, we're going to scroll your names in the bottom of our stream. And so you don't have to donate $35. Correct. You can just, you know, be a patron at the $4 just, level or higher. Just saying. Just saying we're <laughs> undercutting the president here. Maybe a so little. Yeah. You don't have to donate $35 to get your name on our show. And that guy only does that like once a year. We, we do this thing weekly. Weekly, in fact. Yes, yeah. totally. So, you know, for any amount, we've, yeah, so... We just we realize that the president's trying to compete by uh, scrolling names during a live stream, but we can do a way better job of that. Oh my god, this is going to become a thing now. Like I can already see people are already like, I'll run game demos in, awesome. in the misdirected market. You know what else we could do is we could have huh. everybody, all the patrons, vote on us for us to do something, and then we could say, no, we're not going to do it. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. That's accurate. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if, we should not. The things, the I mean, things we're can, not going to emulate. Can we? Can we? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we're in the we're doing a podcast. So, so <laughs> we're, we talk about role playing games. Now. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just go over here, Phil. You ready? Here we go. Go do the thing. Oh. Workshop. New DM. Do stuff. Learn from us. Take the advanced stuff. Learn the basics from it. Come back. Listen to the advanced stuff later. New GM. Be great. Workshop. Nice. You didn't even cough. I no no. But I'm gonna take a take drink a of your coffee. Uh huh. All right, so last week, we started discussing some GMing 101 advice as our contribution to January's new GMing month. We did not finish all of our topics because we had way too many because we're overachievers. So tonight, we are going to keep going and finish off our list. Our list is a list of MMP topics and episodes, which are really more like 300-level discussions, but in this segment, we have distilled them down to some beginner concepts and advice. So new GMs, please listen to this and last week's episode, and then go run some games. Then later, come back and listen to the episodes we reference in these segments. Phil, where would you like to start? Uh, well, I think we start with the part where um, we left off last, which um, I loved. Um, this is genre, understanding genre, episode 264. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of genre in, uh, in your games and why it's important to understand genre. So... From a high level, Chris, what is genre? Genre is a category of artistic, musical, or literary composition characterized by a particular style, form, or content. So, for instance, high fantasy is a genre, space opera is a genre, and Cthulian horror is a genre. So, before we jump to the 101 tips, uh huh, and, and just to kind of recap our show, what's the important part of this? Like, why should you? Why should you be familiar? with the genre of the game. Well, if you are familiar with the genre, you are familiar with the tropes then. And if you're familiar with the tropes, you have the building blocks to emulate the feel and tone of these kinds of genres. So that will help you emulate the feel and tone of the game that you're trying to run. Exactly. And especially if the game doesn't actually have mechanics in it that help emulate that. This is the, your, your shortcut and your uh, backup plan for doing such things. Right. So like, listen, here's the deal. We talked about this last week. At some point when you're GMing, you are going to hit a spot of the game that you are not prepared for. This isn't this players will always find a thing that you weren't expecting uh -huh. and you're going to go off of prep and into improv land. Totally fine. And the, you will be smoother at your improv. If you have good mastery of the tropes of the genre of the game that you're playing. That's true. Because you'll know what fits naturally into what's happening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all of a sudden the players take a turn down a, a different passageway in this cavernous dungeon and you didn't have anything for that. Um, and if you're like, for instance, if you were playing Dungeon World, you might not have anything for that because this might be one of your blank spaces. It's true. But you need to kind of know what are the tropes of dungeon crawling in a natural cavern, right? Like, absolutely. This might be a great time to introduce an underground river. Uh huh. Right. The uh -huh. underground river is a fantastic obstacle. So then you can also use that to, um, to, to connect your blank space back to some space that you actually already have that Absolutely. exists. Absolutely. But the underground river is a thing. Like we've seen it in, we've seen it in film. We've seen it in, yeah, in story. I mean, we could put a rickety bridge across the, across the underground, um, chasm. Yep. There's like, that one. That's a fantastic one. Like, mm -hmm. and now if I, if I couple that with something else we talked about from last week, uh, system mastery, then I might know that, okay, well, I probably want to use some sort of agility check to cross said rickety bridge. Uh-huh. Yeah. Or I might just want to roll my, uh, have people roll my luck die. Uh, yeah, depending on the game. Uh -huh. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, um, so yeah. That's, so, what's the one-on-one tips then that goes along with this? Yeah, so, um, the, the one-on-one, um, the one-on-one tips 
the best place to uh, the best place online to study up on genres is TV tropes. Now, uh-huh. as a joke, we always say set a timer <laughs> uh, because TV tropes. <laughs> oh, is, you can get lost. Yeah, um, TV, TV tropes is so entertaining um, that you will lose your way in it and and get lost, and you'll the time will zip by. You will have no idea where you were. Uh-huh. But if you go to the pages. Um, like action movie, and you read the tropes of the action movies, like you'll start to catch on uh, and make those connections. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, I love TV tropes. Um, I I can't get enough of actually uh, TV tropes. And you can do it by genre. You can look up a particular movie. So, so like if you look at a particular movie, it'll tell you the tropes that are in the movie. And those are clickable. So then you can click the like the trope and go like and read about the trope in all the other places it shows up. Mm-hmm. Like it's rabbit great. hole. <laughs> well, that's it, right? Like it's, it's a total rabbit hole. Like for instance, if you were going to run the ward, the ash can of the ward, the medical drama, mm-hmm. and you don't know too much about medical dramas, bam, and you didn't binge 15 seasons of ER like I did, um, <laughs> and Grey's Anatomy and um, a couple of other ones, like that's a thing like you could go there and look up medical drama and kind of figure out things like, hotshot surgeon that always wants to cut their way through a problem right like that's a that's a that's a trope it is a trope. right mm-hmm. there's a trope about the hotshot surgeon that every problem can be fixed with a scalpel um that kind of thing so that that's what's going to help you this is going to this is going to feed your brain with tropes okay what's another one so another thing is you should are we going to the next idea because uh, the, uh, there's another one i want to you want to talk about the consuming of media yeah I mean, you, I thought you already kind of hit it. You're like, go watch. No, I was like, just go to TV Tropes. Uh, like, just- so the other thing you can do is the other thing that Phil did, if you're going to run your medical drama the ward, just binge watch all of ER and all of Grey's Anatomy and uh, that show, I think, that's not on the air anymore, the uh, Code Black or whatever Oh, yeah, it is. Code, that was a good one. You know what? You, you want to dig funny? into the archives. You got to get you some, uh, some Trapper John MD. Sure. You know what's really funny is there is a ridiculous number of stories um, and situations in ER that show up in um, Grey's Anatomy. Well, I wonder why. I mean, I like, mean, there's only so. If you've told 15 seasons worth of stories, you've pretty much told every that's medical like story. 300 possible. episodes plus of t- of medical stories. Like, I mean, unless you're doing the Sherlock Holmes version, which is House, and I'm sure even some of those probably copied over in some way, shape, or form. Right. Ha- right. Because House is a great right. Like House is a great twist on the medical drama because it's the Sherlock. It's the Sherlock Holmes version of it, um, complete with the very unlikable Sherlock Holmes and a random cast of Watsons. Uh huh. Although really, there's just one Watson. Yeah, I think it changes a little during the. No, the, the um. Oh, what's his face? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's buddy. supposed to be Watson. That's good. I mean, he doesn't. Yeah, he does. He does lean on him like that. Yeah, it's uh, that's actually supposed to be the dynamic of the show. Yeah. Anyway, um, tropes important, man. They really are. And tropes are fun. Let's. I mean, oh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. So some people um, try to go, like some people try to go out of their way to avoid tropes in you know, in games. Keep going. Because um, I know this is, this is where I always get to too, because I right. understand what, what people are saying. You don't want to avoid the trope. You want to avoid the cliche. You want to avoid the cliche. But There's embra- a difference. But embrace the trope because tropes are shortcuts and they help people under, like they help people acclimate themselves and attune themselves to, to the genre of your game. It's true. Yeah. And it's kind of fun. Like, I mean, if you're playing the medical drama and all of a sudden, you know, like you're you're running this ER thing and the doors bust open and the surgical resident comes in, you know, like, you know, like what's going on in here? Like instantly everybody's like, oh, like it's the cutter. Uh-huh. Right. Like and then everybody knows what to do. Right. Like, by the way, Ange helped us out. It's Wilson. Wilson. Yes. There you go. It's been a while since I watched House. Yeah, me too. I, oh, so I just want to say real quick before we switch topics, Avi's like uh, 15 seasons of ER. Oh, Here's geez. the thing. I watched like nine seasons of ER uh, and I watched ER in the beginning because when I was in grad school taking pharmacology, um, sometimes they would use ER as examples. Um, <laughs> like on Fridays after the show aired, they would talk about like, why did they give them this drug? Why did they give them that drug? Anyway, I watched like nine up ep- nine seasons of it. And then it came back on TV and I was like, I'm a finish me the rest of the series. Like I <laughs> stopped watching it and I was like, I'm going to finish these last six seasons. Cause they were like, they compressed them and put them all on like over a month. Mm-hmm. So I did. I just like, I, I, I wanted, I wanted to be a completionist. So nice. I finished the series and it was good. Like they finished the series. Well, anyway, 
You want to move on to steaks? I do. Here, you love this. I'm gonna I got, have you. I got some steaks for you. Yeah. I if you um if you don't have a plug for my iPad that I can plug into your laptop, I'm not going to have a soundboard for the second half of the show. But if you if you if you don't, I I don't. If you do, I do. If Robert gets up <laughs> and goes upstairs, there are oh wait wait nope shit I didn't bring my wrong bag. Um. If if Robert goes upstairs, there are lightning cables upstairs uh, in the living room. I just need an iPad lightning cable for that. Then we will have uh, – th- th- if you can find it, you will have succeeded. And now we know what the stakes are for the situation. Yeah, look over by the um, – I'm on a glorious quest. <laughs> look over by the fireplace. <laughs> oh, man. So – Well, this is real. This is real life. I know, right? So stakes are any part of a resolution Ooh. mechanic, a skill check. Episode 281. It's 281, sorry. It's episode 281. Not that long ago. Not that long ago. Um. They're, they're part of any resolution mechanic, skill check, attack roll, saving throw, etc. And as the word implies, and as we sort of described, they're the things that are at stake in the game. Whether we have a soundboard or don't have a soundboard in the second half of the show. And also my notes. <laughs> That's the other part. Yeah, it gets dicey. Uh-huh. Um, so would you please define stakes, please? Right, so... Um, so as I say, please, twice. And now a third time. Yeah, so we can quickly define stakes as um, something that is staked for gain or loss, the prize in a contest... Um, an interest or share in an understanding or enterprise. Th- this is in role-playing terms, like in a given scene that has a conflict, because you have to have a conflict. In a given scene that has a conflict, what's on the line? Like, Absolutely. What are we, like, if, if we kick in the door um, to the orc chieftain's room, um, there are some implied stakes, but we can actually make them explicit, right? Like, the implied stakes is, the orc chieftain's going to murder you for kicking in the door to his to his room, and your the player stakes are we're gonna stab him in the face and take all his stuff. Uh huh. Or maybe maybe it's something different. Or we will or we won't have a soundboard and notes for the second half of the show. Right. Um, I'm trying to k- keep it to the game stuff. So oh, anyway, okay. <laughs> um, there's o- so first of all, there's almost always I'm gonna say almost there's almost always stakes on both sides of a conflict. It's um, true. Even if the even if the other side is like, I would like to get away from this conflict, that's what's at stake for them, mm-hmm. right? So stakes are what we're playing for, and then we play through the mechanics of the game to see who wins their stakes. Mm-hmm. So if you and I are um, two characters and we're trying to sway Bob, who's the king, into making a decision on whether to attack the elvish kingdoms or not... The stakes are that I would get Bob to agree to attack the Elvish Kingdom, and you would, uh, if you were taking the opposite side of that, your stake would be to get him to not do it. Correct. And then our conflict would be us um, arguing to try to win his favor. Um, and if there were mechanics in the game, like social mechanics, we would engage those social mechanics and we play We would burning him. wheel it up and yeah, load burning, our three in, actions. In, in burning wheel style, we could do that. And if there wasn't um, mechanics, it could just literally be I'm trying to convince Bob, you're trying to convince Bob, and when Bob makes a decision, we find out who won and who got their stakes. Mm-hmm. Screw the elves. Dilly dilly. Dilly well, dilly. Apparently you won. <laughs> um so all right, so from a one on one point of version, um what's well, important about what's important about stakes? When you're in a scene, you need to make sure you know what is at stake. That is the first thing. Uh yeah, because if you don't know what's at stake, you don't really know where the scene's heading. And, and more importantly, you won't really know when it's done. That's also true. It's it's not so hard when it's a combat because uh, it's either kill them or be killed a um, lot of times. A lot of times, but it could be one group is just trying to get the treasure. They don't necessarily ah, want to now, kill everybody. Now else. we are changing the nature of, uh, of, of the stakes of the combat, right? We have put a MacGuffin in there. Mm-hmm. Somebody wants the MacGuffin. That is a... Uh, then the stakes for everybody are really... In some ways, depending on if everybody's trying to get the MacGuffin, get the MacGuffin. Right. Because it could be for one group, protect the MacGuffin, and for the other group, get the MacGuffin. Uh, yeah. And, and combat could be the thing that determines that, right? Like, that, you know, the actual engaging in combat, like, we will murder, one side will murder the other. Mm-hmm. Um, what's, the, uh, what's another thing? Um, so, sorry, I'm tangled up here. With no, that's okay. Boards. You want to hit it? I um, got it. No, I got it. Um, okay. So, here's the thing. We, so, what we're saying is... You need to know the stakes. So when it, like at the beginning of a scene, think to yourself, do I know what's at stake here? And if you don't know, uh, if you don't know for you as the GM, you should definitely pause for a second, 
check your notes if it's a you know if it's a written adventure or whatever kind of check and see if you can figure out what the stakes are um, or kind of logic it out mm-hmm. and if you don't know what the players stakes are it is perfectly fine to just ask them yeah like hey what are what are you guys trying to do here like are you trying to murder all the goblins or are you trying to get away with the gold yeah that's a good thing to ask because then it, it'll inform help inform you for what you should how you should be reacting right now in in the old school days the more adversarial days like players would be remiss to actually give that information up to the GM in fear that it would be used against them. But we live in a more enlightened age. And so (laughs) one should tell their GM what they have at stake because it does help the GM craft the scene to put the things that are at stake in correct opposition. Cause that's when stakes work the best is when there's, when they're opposed to each other and we're struggling over, um, we're struggling over. Even in that kind of playstyle, the I guess we're going to call it OSR playstyle, for, for lack of a better term, I suppose. No, no, let's call it adversarial. No, no, no. I'm not talking about the adversarial part. Like even in OSR playstyle today, okay. it's important to know what the characters are trying to accomplish. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant that thing where you didn't tell as OSR. No, like, no, 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 no. It's not. No, okay. like I think it's. Uh, I mean, you you kind of want to know what the players are going after, like. Like, yeah. why are you doing what you're doing? I need, I just want to know so I can make the correct adjudication. Yeah. I mean, there's times like when we've played like masks and stuff, when we were playing masks, there have been times like in the middle of a scene, you've stopped and looked at me and been like, where are you going here? I do that sometimes. Yeah. Like it's cause it's not clear to you. Yeah, so, like, sometimes we have scenes and then people are starting to do things and I'm like, it's kind of going on and I haven't figured out where they're aiming at. So I have to be, I have to ask the question yeah, like, and what is, are, are you going for something? Is this just a character moment? <laughs> exactly. And it's okay to do that. Like it's, you don't, over time, if you play with the same people, a lot of times you'll be able to start, like you'll be able to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you play the same characters in a campaign, you'll start to figure it out. But if you can't figure it out, it is like so okay to just ask. And it is, um, I mean, I do it all the time. Like if I, you know where I actually learned this, um, where I actually learned this the best is Fiasco. Because in Fiasco, you have to assign that um, the white die or the black die. Yep. So you kind of need to know where the scene's going. Mm-hmm. So if you don't pick it up from the context of what's starting to happen. Got to ask a question sometimes. Right? Like, it's really good to just be kind of like, hey, what are you guys going for here? And then I know which die to use. Right? Like, I know which one that I want to lean towards. Um, but yeah, super important. And um, don't buy into that thing where you can't talk about it. Like, totally talk about it. It makes uh-huh. it more interesting. There's a great comment by uh, Jared Rashford in the in the chat room. He's it, it, this is the adversarial thing, right? Like uh-huh. somebody does. I'm going to put a match on this window frame. Then I would like to super glue this quarter down in front of the door. Then I'd like to put this peep uh, fold this piece of paper in half. Somebody says why, and then somebody says you'll see. Yeah, I'm like oh. no, I, I need to know what's going on so I can adjudicate this properly. Otherwise, I'm just going to not let you. I'm like when it, when the thing that you want to happen starts happening, it's probably just not going to work. Right. So here's the fear. Right. So let, to break this down, so the player has come up with something clever, right, and they want to show that they're clever, so they're doing this thing. Yeah. And they don't want to reveal it to the GM because their fear is that the GM is going to take the knowledge of this and thwart it and be like, oh, he steps right over the quarter, right. And then it's ruined. What a good GM does is once they hear what's at stake, like, oh, I've made this kind of Rube Goldberg trap that's going to create a diversion so that I can get the jump on this guy. Uh huh. Right. Then what the GM can do is, and, and this is, you know, um, this is, I think the way I like, I like to handle it is I would be like, okay, if it's plausible that it would just happen, I'll let it happen. But most times I'll let the dice decide. Right. Like, I may make an observation check or an int check or like maybe he thinks you're up to something. Um, You know, give me a deception so that you don't pull off like that. You're anxiously awaiting for him to pick up that quarter, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And let you know where, you know, disdain decision, you know, um, what is it? Um, Don't make the decision, but let the dice decide. Correct. Yeah. Uh, That's how why we have randomizers. Yeah. That's, that's how you do that. Uh huh. Um, Like I can, and I have tools as a game master to, I have tools as a game master to, to reward you for being clever, usually, in games. I can give you circumstantial bonuses. I can do all that kind of right. stuff. Right, and, and, and I can make, and I can use the mechanics to have my, um, I can use the mechanics to have my NPCs um, figure out or not. Uh-huh. Like, it, you know, like. Roll, the cr- and roll a perception check. Yeah. Roll and roll a, uh, an intuition check. 
Yeah. Like, why is there a quarter over here? I, I oh, I see that match on the. I rolled a twenty-seven. I see the match on the on the windowsill over there. Right. I'm instantly suspicious. Yeah. Yeah. And listen, that's a sign that you know this creature's you know pretty proficient. So, it, I get why it happens. And I will say that when I was younger, this was a rampant problem because this was a more ed- in the 80s, a lot of GMs were more adversarial. Mm-hmm. And um, I like to think now that um, collaborative is actually more fun, but not give the players everything. Let the game, let the mechanics bear that out. But, you know, if you're a player, if you're a player, tell your GM. If you're a GM, don't be arbitrary and squash it. Let the dice decide. Uh-huh. I mean... That's actually kind of a tenant in a lot of ways of... Uh, um, in many games, it is actually now coded into the game, but not all of them. Like like um, that emergent play idea? Yeah. Like the dice help things emerge. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, it's in fact it's more interesting. It, it definitely can be. Yeah. So absolutely. I, I, I mean, that was a, actually... Thank you, Jared. That was a great example of... Mm-hmm. A great example and a great way to kind of take that apart and explain um, what's happening. It kind of goes with that idea... Um, which is actually encoded into powered by the um, apocalypse, which is be a fan of the players, mm-hmm. right? Like if my players tell me they're going to do like a cool Ro- Rube Goldberg diversion, I'm like, all I'm right, like, like, yeah, cool. Like, show me this, man. Like, yep. how's this? Tell go- me about like, it. And let's roll some dice. Yeah. Like, oh, how's you roll this a going six, down? You roll a six minus. Oh, okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like I, that's, that's what I want to see. Like, yeah. Tell me how this cool thing. In fact, in a, in a powered by the apocalypse game, you could simply tell me, I'm making a Rube Goldberg distraction. And then I'd be like, all right, well, kind of give me an idea of what it looks like. Yeah. And then you'd start telling me and I'd be like, uh, yeah, let's, um, you know, let's, let's make a defy danger decks to see if you can, uh, put all those things in place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Coolness, man. All right, let's go, uh, to the chat room for life. But before we do that, here's another show from misdirected Mark productions, the gnome cast, several gnomes from gnome stew get together and talk about a gaming topic and themselves a bit in an effort to avoid being thrown into the stew and to entertain you. And, um, John found about, about my, uh, my little trap door that I have in the stew pot. So every time I get thrown in, I actually survive, which they keep wondering how I keep sta- surviving the stew pot. Now they know he re- like re rigged the security. If you want, um, as a founding gnome, I could probably at this point share with you the um, the arcane power words uh, that the gnomes of past yeah. will actually um, will actually protect you and guide you through the story. I'd appreciate things. that because you know at some point I'm actually superfluous because I have an intern that edits the gnome cast. Thank you, Rob Eberzato, <laughs> and you know Ange and John can like put the show notes together and whatnot. They know how to use Zencaster and have the password. So I mean, I'm, I'm I've you're reached afraid, the end. you're afraid <laughs> your usefulness is coming to an end. Don't yeah. don't tell anybody, shh, but. I snuck into the room with the stew pot before we did the broadcast. Yeah. And I carved handholds into the side of it. Oh, good. <laughs> so that you can climb out, even uh, if it's like slippery with stew. Neat. They're, they're like, Err. fantastic. So, so we got like many points of egress from the stew pot. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's right. I, I, it's funny when you guys talked about, I didn't get to listen to the episode yet, but you guys talk about how the stew got put together, like how the stew operates. Mm-hmm. I, I Did John talk about the the um, the early days when there was no Google calendar? Oh. You know what? I don't think he did, but. We, we uh. used, we had to fight to get Martin to agree to have a calendar. Yeah. Really? And schedule. It used to be in the early days, people just threw articles on the site like five days a week. No planning. <laughs> it was one day we're like, why don't we have a calendar? Now nah, it seems like too much work. Wow. Until we started posting like <laughs> two articles a day. And it was like, how about we have a calendar? And like grudgingly, eventually it was like, okay, I guess if you guys want to have a calendar. Martin seems like the most chill, no effort. Oh, yeah. I love him to death, but yes, like y- you could imagine my hyper organized, whatever <laughs> is like, you know, having spasms, you know. Like, I very much enjoy working for John over there. It's enjoyable. John's great. I love John. Good peeps. Cool. I love Gnomecast, too. I got to be on again. I haven't been on in a while. Yeah. Uh, what else is in the chat room? Anything? Uh, Jared followed up his, uh, his his comment that spurred you into that part of the conversation with, as a GM, I want you to do awesome stuff. I may not want you to end the story with one single trick, but I want your plans to work, which that's, that's, that's be a fan of the players, man. It's, it's weird yeah. how we went from stakes into be a fan of the players as, an, as yeah. a thing that you should 
It's funny because we've never done a whole, we've never done a show or a workshop on being a fan of the players. Well, maybe we should do that too. Interesting one, Bob. Can you pin that? I would love to do a be a fan of the players. Be a fan of the players. The first time I read that in Apocalypse World, I was like, "Holy shit, that's genius!" And it wasn't like I wasn't. It just was really cool to actually have Vincent like just put into yeah. words like, "Why don't you just do this and it's okay?" So, is that dynamic? And that's um, Eli Kurtz. Yes, it is. Oh, Zhang Yu Hustle. Oh, welcome back, Eli. Welcome back. I hope you had an enjoyable honeymoon. Yeah, really. Eli, in the chat room, do you mind telling us where you went on your honeymoon? And then we'll let everybody else know. But he said, um, the withholding mystery style of play isn't bad as much as it fails to bring in any of the other players, GM included. Um, I don't mind if the game is about a mystery that you only give out, you dole out pieces of it, but that's the whole idea of the the core clue concept, the trail. Like also like if you, you, you you're just distributing information slowly to reveal things. It's sort of a beat pacing thing. Uh, I, yeah, in mysteries. So in mysteries, it's fine to actually withhold information for the players. Like that's the, um, I mean, that's kind of what a mystery is about is, is finding those pieces. I, I think where I'm a little less cool with it is if a player makes up a mystery for their character and doesn't tell the rest of the players, like, oh, I got this secret. I can't tell you guys. I'm going to pass a couple notes to the GM. Like, my secret is, like, I'm going to turn into a demon and betray all your asses. I mean, might. You know, and then I'm just not going to tell anyone. <laughs> like, I'm, like, a little less cool than if a player is sitting there like a ticking time bomb. Especially if that wasn't the game that was decided to be played at the beginning. Right. Now, if a player tells me in session zero, like, I'd like to play a ticking time bomb, and, you know, maybe you guys can save me, maybe you can't kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I'm actually probably be like, All okay, right. that's cool. Like, then I don't. We, and then we can talk about the stakes of how can we save you versus how can we not save you. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. So that, I mean, that, that thing's very personal, right? I don't like, um, I don't like that kind of blindsiding as a, as a player, as a person. I don't like that kind of blindsiding. So I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with betrayal in games when betrayal is a thing that's on the table. Mm hmm. I have a problem when it's not on the table and it suddenly comes up. So if you want to tell me that like you want to play a Cylon and not know it and you know, you're not going to know it for a while in the game, like I'll actually encourage it. Mm -hmm. But if you tell me mid game, you're a Cylon, I will probably shoot you. <laughs> no in fact, fracking that actually, yeah. In fact, that actually happened in a game. Can I tell a, a quick gaming story? Do the thing. So back in the day, Bob ran this Palladium fantasy campaign and, um, it was terrible. It wasn't terrible. It was outrageous, but it wasn't terrible. <laughs> and Gilgor played a changeling assassin and changelings for whatever reason, couldn't see in the dark. And I was an elf and we were escaping from, through these caverns out from this, um, wizard school. And I'm zipping through the dark caverns and he keeps bumping into things, even though he looks like an elf. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm like, Hey, what's up? And he's like, Oh, nothing. I'm just clumsy. And I'm like, okay. And for like session after session shit happens. And I'm like, I think he's a fucking changeling. <laughs> right. And I'm, t and I'm telling Mike this and I'm like, I think he's a fucking changeling. And so finally we all had like horrible secrets and we were all running from something. So we sat him down one day and we're like, look, I think you have a secret you're not telling us and you can tell us whatever. Like I can't travel East or I can't travel in the lands of the elves. Mike can't go West. We have to keep constantly go East because things from the West are trying to hunt and capture Mike. <laughs> like whatever, whatever your thing is, it's okay. And Sean's like, Nope, Nope, Nope. I'm just a, you know, I'm just a librarian, blah, blah, blah. Yep. More sessions go by and we're riding in a stagecoach. And Sean's like, he, he's like, okay, guys, I change shape into a changeling. I'm a changeling. Now we had already just fought like a previous session, like five changelings mm -hmm. that like nearly fucked us up. So he turns into a changeling and I just blew his ass out the side of the, I <laughs> cast a spell and it blew his ass right out of the side of the side coach. The, ah, the stage changeling. coach. I was like, mother, like I flew out of, I mean, like I shot him out of the stagecoach, flew out the stagecoach behind him and like oh. was towering over him, hands glowing. Like I told you, you motherfucker, like <laughs> I knew you had something to hide. You could have just told us. Oh like, man, that's funny. This is yeah. why you don't have player secrets. Like nope. I, I was ready I to. Don't, don't have a problem with player secrets as long as we've agreed at the beginning that we're going yeah. to have player secrets. And if you have a player secret in the beginning, man, I will even help you. 
Uh huh. Because I will even pretend to not notice shit. Yeah, I mean, it, even if you don't want to tell each other stuff, like that's okay. Like as long as everybody knows that there's a thing, especially how those secrets will get revealed eventually. Like, is it really stuff that's going to affect each other directly, or is it stuff that's indirectly affecting the group because it's outside forces affecting from yeah. those secrets? I mean, timing wise, if Sean had told us that like months earlier before the changelings had messed with us it was probably going to be okay. Like, yeah. But after the changelings messed with us and then he confesses to be a changeling, it's like, well, no. The, the realize is he should have confessed it when you and Mike came clean yeah, to him. Yeah, we gave him the yeah. opening, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it was, you know, it was a thing. But anyway, it was... It would I have mean, been a cool moment too, like the the group becoming more trustworthy of each other. Well, yeah, and it yeah. would have been like, oh, you also have a secret. Like, oh, yeah. we do too. Like, great. We're all, you know... We're all outlaws together. Mm-hmm. It's cool to be an outlaw. It's cool. It's cool to have an outlaw name. <laughs> it's cool to have an outlaw name. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it was. I mean, it was a funny story because it was just. Um, maybe maybe we should get back to the. the yeah, actual, we should get back to the thing. Yeah. Do all right. Thing. So, um, anything else in the chat room? Uh, Senda's gonna uh, rejoin us a little yep. bit. Yep. Senda's off to uh, put her kiddo to bed. Exactly. Right. I don't know why all the listeners need to know that, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Yeah, we all. There know. you go. Everybody <laughs> else know. knows. Yeah, we all know this. Yeah. And uh, Eli went to Costa Rica. Yeah, Costa yeah. exotic Costa Rica. He slept under a uh, under some trowler monkeys for three days. He howler. said it was howler monkeys for three days. He said it was better than it sounds. Um, yeah, I could imagine. I'm um, I'm less outdoorsy. I, I I liked um, I liked I liked our our trip like all inclusive resort. Like <laughs> that's my level of roughing it. Sure, <laughs> I mean I slept in a tent before. I don't mind. Uh, I, oh, I've done it a lot. I mean, I've slept in a hammock outside and shit like that. But I mean, if you want, you want to know the truth, like I like roughing it in all occlusive resort. You like the glamp. I do, Oh Not man, even. I totally would. I totally would fucking glamp. <laughs> shit, yeah, man. Uh, Wi-Fi and a book and sit out in nature and like read and shit. I totally funny. would do that. All right. Let's talk about spotlight management, which was episode 282, oh. which is the one right after 281. We must've been on a roll. We might've been on a bit of a roll. I think. So spotlight when a PC is the, uh, you know, you color coded these. So never mind. Uh, no, I didn't color code these. I think you did. Oh, never mind. I probably just co- copied and pasted <laughs> this from the old show notes. I cut and pasted this from the old show notes. Oh, fantastic. What the hell Wait, is Who that? talks first? Do you talk first? Do I talk you, first? Do I talk first? Who goes first? This is here? awkward. Anyways, now that we've made a joke about the show notes, we can proceed forward. Um, oh boy. So when a PC is at the center of the action in a given scene, so it's time to pick this apart. Right. So, um, so there's a couple ways to, to look at this, right? Like the player character could be on the spotlight. Uh-huh. Um, and um, it could be a subset. So it could be it could be you and Bob uh-huh. off having a uh-huh. scene put the spotlight on you. Spotlight's the center of the action. Correct. Yep. It's those moments that the character is doing the center stage at the table. And we know this because the GM's interacting. Like this is what it looks like, right? The GM's talking to you two and everybody else is kind of sitting watching. Mm-hmm. Right? Like... You we know. have we have switched somebody as being the actor and entertaining, and everybody else is being audience spectator. Right? Yeah, this is that audience spectator thing mm-hmm. that we talk we, yeah. we talk about. And if we're talking to our one on one GMs, understand that it, at any time within a role playing game, uh, we are all players and and we are all spectators. Correct. And a GM is just a specialized type of player. Yep. That's how that's that is how we classify. Be that. the referee, facilitator, uh, adjudicator, whatever. Yeah adversary if that's your game Mm -hmm. not recommended but sure hey man some games have that built into it where you can be adversarial because you have points that you can use to spend to be adversarial Uh or you know you could play like old school paranoia where it's just you're flat out told like you know you're the you're the computer f them over but have some fun doing it yeah make sure they're laughing while you're doing it. you must if you're going to screw them make sure they're laughing yeah Yeah. it's kind of the beauty of old school paranoia (laughs) it's pretty lawless anyway um so that's what it, so t- so that's what it looks like, and we kind of know this naturally because turn taking is a form of spotlight management. It's true, you know, like even if you were talking about board games, like it's your turn, Chris, right? That like no one else is moving their pieces, no one else is rolling dice. Your it's your turn. Come on, initiative is a form of passing spotlight. Yeah, initiative is a way of actually organizing how the spotlight will be passed. Correct. Yeah. So, um, so the questions about spotlight then is. How long does a spotlight stay on someone and how long does it take for the spotlight to get back to them? Yes. Those are the, really the two important things when we talk about spotlight, um, is how long is it on a person and when will it come back to them? Yeah. So let's kick it to the, the one one Um, yeah, I think. In, Unless you want to talk about management first, but you just did really. Yeah. I just want to touch on, on a piece of that. All right. 
how long the spotlight sits on someone means that the longer it sits on them, everyone else isn't doing anything. That's true. Right? So that's okay for a little while. And then the longer it goes, people start to switch. Remember, we talked about this in the previous episode. They start to drift in levels in in layers of the game. Uh-huh. Right? They start drifting upward towards that personal space. Yeah, like, unless, unless the people that you're spotlighting are being super entertaining. Right. You know, like... If the spotlight's staying on you and Bob's focusing all of his effort on you, in a little while, I'm going to start wondering, like, do I have any messages on my phone? Did I, do I need to go, to, you know, do I need to go run yeah. to the bathroom? Do I need to, like, I start to lose it. So there's a sweet spot for how long to stay on you before we move. There is. And it's hard to learn what that is, but uh, uh, it, what it's not because a lot of people will say, well, I stay on you until the conflict is resolved. God, no. God, no. <laughs> no, there are ups and downs inside a conflict, and it's in those, it's in those changes in beat. Didn't we talk about beat structure last time? We did. So yeah. it's in, in, the, in, the, in the beats of a particular scene with a character, the changing of the beat is a great time to pass the spotlight. Uh-huh. And you can see that in television shows when they cut away, especially in um, soap operas. Go watch yes. a soap opera. You'll see how that works. Yes. Go watch a soap opera. Um, go, yeah. Go watch a soap opera. It's a great way to see spotlight there's, management. There's a thing where like a question is raised. Mm-hmm. Then you cut away. Yep. A thing where um, a thing is revealed. The door opens and Raul's brother is standing there. The then dramatic cut moment cut. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's the importance of how long to keep a spotlight. The, the other one is how soon will the spotlight return? So this is the same problem. You've moved the spotlight from, I've moved the spotlight from Chris to Bob. But now if it takes me forever to get back around the table, you start to drift again. Uh-huh. And unless, of course, you're being super entertaining. Unless I'm being super entertaining, which is possible. But even if I'm being super entertaining for Bob, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm being super entertaining to you. I mean, that's what I mean. Unless the people are being super entertaining together to entertain exactly. the table. Yeah. And from the player perspective, if I can jump in for a second. Absolutely. Actually, we were just talking about this over drinks. We'll tell you in a minute. Yeah. Go ahead. But from the player perspective, when, when you're doing that spotlight moving around the table, um, you as a player should be a fan of the other players as yes. well. You, you should be and as much as you can. pay attention to what they're doing in their scenes. And, and because not only will you stay engaged in the game, but you may you may notice something that you would have missed that may be a seed for something that you can use later. Uh-huh. Um, you know, stuff that like maybe sometimes you'll source the table. You pick something up and go, oh, that would go great for that hole I left in my backstory or whatever. Uh-huh. And that all is better engagement at the table and there real are, fun. There are certain games where like if the game is slightly adversarial, I try not to pay a sharp attention. Yes. Because I'm trying not to accidentally collect meta knowledge. So yep. I may just kind of zone out a little because it's like, well, I really don't want to know what happened yeah. in that scene because I wasn't in that scene. Yeah. It's funny. I always want to collect all that meta knowledge too so I can figure out how my character will eventually figure that stuff out. My problem is I think I'm going to instantly bias myself. Uh. Like if I see it, I'm not going to be able to unthink it. So sometimes I fuzz out a little so that I can stay away from it. But if it's something like, like, like when we were playing Dungeon World, there's no reason for me not to know everything that's going on when the spotlight's not on me. It's true. So I'm like... Like, I'm, like, totally paying attention, yeah. right? Like, I'm, I'm in. Also, same thing with masks. Like, masks was the same way. Like, there's no reason for me not to know what's going on, so I'm just watching. Also, if you're paying attention in the Dungeon World game, you're going to see something crazy, like a giant elephant that's flipping boats, or, you know, yeah, yeah. you never know what you're <laughs> going to... Dead God showing up. You or, never you know, know what you're going to see in that game. But anyway... Damn it, Bardic. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's a, that's, a, like, that's a good point. Like, you really should, as table etiquette, you should be a fan of the other players and be supporting them by listening to their scenes. You shouldn't be like, well, the spotlight's not on me. Fuck off. I'm going to like, yeah. where's my phone? I got, you know, yeah. I got some games to play or something. Um, but yeah, so the, um, so the other part of that is, so one, you're right. Pay attention to, um, keep that spotlight moving, right? Like if you move it around, um, to player to player, that's the important part. And as a GM, it's important to remember if you're not using a fixed pattern, like I'm going around, like I'm going to, for the, until the next break, it's Chris, Bob, Jerry, Chris, Bob, Jerry, Chris, you know, like that, then you need to be cognizant. Like when was the last time I, when was the last time I put the spotlight on Chris? Has it been a little while? I need to swing it over to Chris. That's a thing. Yeah. So we're going to get to the one one in a second, but I just want to say this, even experienced, 
even really good GMs sometimes struggle with spotlight management. They do. It is an art form. The GMs who get a natural knack for it, everybody, you will know, you will know when you play with them. And the GMs that struggle with it will, even if you are proficient in it, some days, like you just get caught up and you like forget to move the spotlight and stuff like that. It's okay to, it's okay oh, to nudge it along. Especially if a player is giving you a super entertaining scene. It's easy to get caught up in that. It's true. I mean, sometimes as a GM, you get sucked into yeah. it and you're like, I'm having this oh, amazing man, scene. This I don't want to break away yeah. from this. I often have to do that when I'm um, game mastering for Phil. Like, I actually have to find the places to break because I will just sit there and banter back and forth with him constantly. I, I, I often do a thing, and I do it uh, frequently in Dungeon World, where I will quickly say, like, there'll be a good scene going on, and I'll be like, okay, Bob, you're on deck. Like, just, <laughs> like, no, like, in yeah. a second, I'm going to pull this spotlight off. It's coming to you. Like, that kind of thing. Uh, let's do the 101 thing. Okay, now let's do the 101 thing. That's so, awesome. first thing, you do not want to spend too much time with a single character. Yeah, don't don't. It's it's not. It it is a is a is a ensemble piece, and you want to keep making sure that you're moving the spotlight around to make it feel like an ensemble piece, right? Because the players will know, like subconsciously, players know who's getting the spotlight and who isn't. Uh huh. And they will react to it. <laughs> you know, like if all I do is pay attention to Chris, eventually Bob's going to get annoyed in this game. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, keep going. So the thing that you want to do is you want to aim at conflicts and you want to try to recognize the, those moments where you can actually cut away or put somebody in danger or usually it's a die roll that works well mm-hmm. in oh, a die roll's a great one. Um, or whenever a move is triggered, like after the move is resolved, then you move on. Do you like the die roll, like make the die roll and then, and then break away or do you like, like don't touch those dice when I come back to you, we're going to roll and find out what happens. I do both, but I prefer the um, first one more because usually the first one will give me an idea some of narrative what you're fuel, back to. and then I can kick it off to somebody else. Like, oh look, you're in trouble. I mean, you did a thing, but you're in trouble. Hey, you, what do you do about the fact that he's in trouble? Plus, yeah. in PBTA, a six minus means, hey, I'm going to just take that and not put it on you. I'm going to swing it over to Bob, uh-huh. or I'll put it on you real bad and then put it on somebody to save you. Yep. I'm tired today. I don't know why. I don't know. You're doing fine. Somebody just noticed. Said, oh, wake up, Chris. Said, wake up, Chris. <laughs> I don't know. We had a pretty chill dinner. We did. I've been yawning since we started recording. Did you? Anyways, um, that's that's really the first one. I mean, you you don't have to rush it. I'm actually guilty of rushing sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, playing more. Uh, so playing with Tom Flanagan, Tom Flanagan, the Knights of the Night, they tend to linger more on player character scenes to let them chew the scenery. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, you're a smash cut guy, though. I'm a totally a smash cut yep, guy because yeah. I tend to run pulpy action games. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm actually used to this because I've played a lot of games with you. Mm-hmm. Like when action heats up, you move the spotlight very quickly. Yes. I suspect when we play Urban Shadows, it'll be a little, little more less. lingering. And yeah. it's also because I've been playing games with like Tom and yeah. Brett and, and Emily. And we tend to like they've been running and they, they linger a little bit longer than I tend to. And uh, it was a thing that when I uh, was running Dungeons and Dragons for them, they were like, you should just let us linger and play these characters a little bit yeah. more. Because, you know, I'm always, I'm super pacey guy, right? Like, yes. let's move on to the next beat. Let's go to the next beat. Let's yeah. see what the next thing that happens is. But they want to, they want to, they want to talk and they want to explore their, their characters a lot more in their conversations. I get that from you in combat. When I run combats, I run combats with a lot of smashy mm-hmm. scene cutting, but I am also um, guilty of, um, I totally get into scenes like when we start, like we were playing uh, Tales from the Loop a couple weeks ago before I broke my arm and we did the um, the anchor scenes, the scene where you clear all your um, conditions and um, I wound up getting sucked into those. Like they were super, each one of them, there was one for each character and they were like these super deep discussions with the adults after like what happened in that mystery and like I couldn't even move the spotlight. Like I just did each one individually. I was like, these are so good. Like, and everybody else was with us. Like everybody else was like watching. Yep. So it was like, I'm I'm not even moving the spotlight from this. Like I'm doing Bob's, then I'm doing Glenn's, and then I'm doing Tony's. And like I'm doing the like they were like 10, 15 minutes a scene and nobody blinked. Um it was good stuff. It was good. It was good, it was good scene chewing. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I you got to pin those posts that are going on in the chat room right now so yeah. we can talk about them later because there's nothing intimidating about playing games with us. I'm just saying. We're just, we, just, we just play games. We're, no, I, if anything, I think we're actually... Um, there's, no, there's no level that you need to achieve. No, no. In fact, we're... Um, what you call it? 
No, I mean, I actually, I've actually, I'm going to play with you for a while. You're actually quite inviting. You're actually really good when um, introducing new people to stuff. Yeah, I, I try to be. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm spreading, spreading the gospel. I feel I, like I'm getting better at it because I've had to do so many um, Hydro Hacker games now that like I've gotten the knack down of like, okay, there's no possible way you've ever heard of this game. So let me, you know, let me kind of intro, let me introduce you to this. <laughs> Somebody just called us, Mo just called us the American gods of jamming advice. Jeez. Come on. Gods. Of advice. Yeah. G-A-W-D-S. Gods. <laughs> so of advice. Gods. I'm taking, I'm taking it's that. It's killer. It's I'm hilarious. Like, yeah. Oh man. It's funny when other people start saying stuff like that. It makes me, I get blushy. I, wow. I'm blushing. That never happens. Um, anyways, uh, so we move on to the next one. So we move on to the next one. Can I can I stick one more thing into? Yeah, go ahead, man. Particular thing. So um, one time when you might want to linger more on one player than the others, and that would be if you've got like a noob at the table who's not like you know who's tentative maybe. You, you might want to linger there a little bit to try and draw them out on occasion, depending on the, on the type of player. If like, if you know what yeah, they're, you know, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. So what you want to do is you want to, um, you want to push at them now and again, yeah. see if they're comfortable, try different things with them, give them very deliberate choices. Yeah. Then they can do things and, and like, um, and, and sometimes give them more open choices so that they can make, make some stuff up. But really you want to really try to focus down on them if they're really uncomfortable with that stuff. I know cause I've had many new players like that at my table. Um, also when you want to spotlight somebody like that, if you can spotlight them and it's supposed to be more of a dramatic scene, put another player that you're comfortable with and you trust in the scene with them so that they can talk to them and then it can be a duo scene. You're actually getting two people spotlighted at the same time. Right. And you'll know when a, com- when a player is uncomfortable with a spotlight because they'll do or say whatever they think will get the spotlight off of them. Uh-huh. Right. So if you ask them like what they're doing, they might say something like, um, check in my backpack. No, they don't want the spotlight then. Right. Like they're trying, like they will try to give you subtle clues yeah. to try to pass off the spotlight. Um, and sometimes it's a matter of just understanding what, so not everybody wants the spotlight, um, for the same reasons. So if you can also incorporate what they like, like maybe the character likes to support other characters. So like Chris said, it's better to spotlight them in a scene where they can help somebody else. Like that's useful. Um, yeah, it takes, so that takes actually a little, um, figuring out. And sometimes it, sometimes it just requires you to actually go talk to the player. Mm -hmm. And some players may tell you, like, I actually don't like the spotlight. Like I, I just like, like I like coming, like watching everybody else. Mm -hmm. And like, I like doing my part and smashing up a few goblins or something. Yeah, that's fine too. And then you're like, oh, but then you know what they want. Yeah. Oh, good. Then I, I, I won't force you into the spotlight. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the GMPC episode 210. Dun, dun, dun. Whatever. (laughs) Whatever. <laughs> a character that is controlled by the GM is part of the group that are known as player characters. They are basically essentially a player character like everybody else. Okay, so let's clear this up for our one-on-ones. As a, as a GM, you are going to have many non-player characters or NPCs. And these uh-huh. are the characters, the shopkeeper, the orc chieftain, whatever that you play. The GM PC, as Chris said, is very specifically, you have chosen to play a fully functional character like the other players or a character that was an NPC has evolved into a fully functional character like the PC and, and by fully functional character, you have stats for them. They have hit points, whatever. Like they have, they are bound by the player mechanics. Sort of, of kind of mostly. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, they should, if you're going to make them a character, well, I this mean, is you, where it goes horribly wrong, right? Like well, this, you could pull a, you could pull a stat block. I've seen people pull like a stat block guard or a hobgoblin, whatever out of the book. And, and that's the character. Sheet. Well, that's okay. Then they're at least bound by some, they're bound by the rules in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Now here, we're going to get to the tip in a second, but here's why, um, this is much maligned. And we will say, if you go listen to episode two ten, you will find out why, um, we actually make a case that it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, the reason people don't like this is that, um, when it goes wrong, and that is when the GM falls in love and becomes a fan of the GM PC and spotlights it more than the PCs, this then becomes a real problem. Like, GMs, please do not do these things. <laughs> right. If, if, your, if your character is more competent or more useful than the players in the party, you have done this incorrectly. I agree. And 
And even if they're on par with the players, if you spotlight the GM PC more than you spotlight the players, you are still doing this wrong. You want them to be a part of the group, not better than the group. In fact, or more prominent in, than in anybody fact, else in the group. They're best when they're the supporting characters in a group. They can be. I mean, I yeah. prefer to. Ha- I mean, I like them for. I've been doing it for such a long time. You know, I mean. No, but I like them for. Like, I personally, I like them for uses. Like, to me, a droid in a sci fi game is a great GM PC, right? They know a few things. They got a few like, sure. oh, I can open that door. Um, they have some knowledge. They're, they're, they're trucking around with the players. But, you know, like, like when the gunfight starts at Bespin, the droids just like roll away. Uh-huh. And <laughs> here you go. Check it out. Your GM PC should fill some sort of role that maybe the player characters don't necessarily have in their, in their group. Right. And not of all of them. And not all of them. And... And as you are constructing these scenarios, assuming you're constructing your own scenarios and adventures and whatnot, the pi- the parts that the GMPC might be useful should be pretty rare. Uh huh. Yes, I think when I ran when I ran Iron Heroes, which was my most um, active GMPC, one story it was more than one session. One story had to do with his backstory. Mm-hmm. Um, and even then the player still actually, um, defeated the thing that was like the haunt that was haunting him. He was also around for a while at that point, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. he was cared about by the other player characters. Oh yes. yeah. I didn't, I didn't spring his backstory for like uh, two whole arcs uh-huh. so, and then did his backstory. Hey, hey, GMs who are thinking about this stuff, you want the player characters to actually enjoy your play, your, your GM PC first. Like they have to like him <laughs> yeah. or her or and, whoever they and, are. And, and honestly, you know what it was good for? the characters traveled a lot, so they didn't have any, um, like there weren't a lot of reoccurring NPCs. So the, really the role, because it filled a tactical role. Cause it was a, obviously it's, it was, um, Iron Heroes. Fighter. Yeah. But the other thing it really filled for me was it gave me a consistent NPC to engage in scenes with them. Yeah. And that was to me the most fun. Like yeah. the actual play in the combat was amusing, but what was really better was where in between fights, I could um, I could interact with the players and talk to them and ask questions and stuff and and we could have that kind of um, we could have the more dramatic scenes. So here's GMs out there, one oh one tip thing. What Phil just said is actually like one that we don't have on the list. Like GM PCs are great for being able to insert yourself into play to have conversations with the player characters to ask them questions to see how they feel without it being metagame yeah Mm -hmm. if you want to play in the character level a lot that's the way that you play in the character level a lot yeah and then just tone everything else back on the gmpc so the players aren't threatened um and and yeah just it's a great it's a great way to inject yourself now if you're playing in a place where you have like a base of operations Mm -hmm. and the players are always coming back you don't really need a GM PC. You, you can just have a couple of really good reoccurring NPCs. Uh-huh. But like Mike, like in Iron Heroes, those guys just wandered. Yeah, they were so, all over the place. <laughs> like they traversed I mean, the it continent. Was, it was about going around and fixing problems in the five corners of the world or exactly. five corners of the land. Yep. So it was it was good to have a um, a GM PC to be my connection to them. Yeah. And we do have a full episode on this, so we should probably just move yes. on. <laughs> and time to give the one one tip. Yeah. Yes. Well, I gave one of them. <laughs> the one one tip. Don't do this right away. Yes. Don't. If you hear this and you're like, oh, that sounds like a cool idea and you're just learning to GM, don't. There'll be time. There'll be a future campaign. You can break, You can try this out. Work it's it not a one-on-one thing. If you want to learn how to act, use NPCs. If you want to learn how to do voices, use NPCs. If you want to learn how to you know, get your characters in there and, and try different things, use NPCs. In fact, it'll be better because you can try a bunch of different things. Indeed. All right. What's in the chat room? Oh, the chairman was uh, was chock full of stuff on this one. So, um, Jared said, um, and when we were talking about the, the the cutting, so you hit the zombie over the back with a container of accelerants while it is on fire. Give me uh, give me a kick some ass. That's a five. Let's cut back to the parking lot. Uh huh. <laughs> I mean, sometimes sometimes they'll tell you like in in like when you're learning uh, PBTA to to cut that spotlight on a six so that you have time to think about what move you want to make. Yeah. Really? I'd be like, let's cut back to the parking lot. Hey, Bob, you're in the parking lot dealing with this vampire yeah. and there's a giant explosion 
<laughs> from a block over. <laughs> it distracts you. <laughs> <laughs> then, then the player character who is just hitting somebody over the head with a, j- a gas can full of accelerant is is like, oh no, oh, no. like there a you lot. go. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mo said he's been thinking about uh, about trying to play with us uh, at Origins. Sixty percent of him is really hyped and wants to play a game with the MM crew. Forty percent is scared to death to play a game with the MM crew because he doesn't think he would live up to <laughs> one, our level. One, we're not that intimidating. No. Two, we're, we might not be nearly as good as you think. <laughs> yeah. Like, and, and what's that thing about never meet your heroes? <laughs> well, if you meet them, <laughs> just just kill them. Um, yeah, exactly. No, and the other the other pieces. I actually, and I can say this about you, and you know, I don't I don't know if it's true for me, but. Um, you actually do a good job of actually bringing out, um, y- like bringing players out. Yeah, I mean that's that's a thing. Like, I I don't know. It's it's something yeah. I've tried to do for so long. So. Yeah. So um, no, you should you should by all means you should by all means play with the game. Plus, mode. I mean, I ass- I'm 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 pretty much just assuming that most of the people that are in this chat room that would come and hang out with us are just amazingly good players anyway. Oh yeah, absolutely. But if not, I'll help. I mean, yeah, I haven't met anybody from the community who's not so. You know, I think here's the thing. Um, a good GM, like, and I guess this ties into the one-on-one thing. When you're first learning, you're you're basically trying to master juggling all of your shit, right? When you have mastered that, a good GM knows how to actually bring out good play in players. Yeah. Like, a good GM will find out um, something a player likes. We'll figure out how to draw a player out into a scene. Um, we'll help them. And I think like, as you become a more experienced GM, that's the thing that you learn how to do is like, you've got your shit covered. You can improv, you can do voices. You got, you know, your tropes and all that stuff. The next part is like, what can you do to make players like it's the entertainer part? What do you, can yeah. you do to make this enjoyable for that player? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anybody who's who, who might feel intimidated or anything like that by coming and playing with us, don't be. Because if you're going to sit down and play a game with one of us, at the table are probably going to be a bunch of us too. And we're all just going to help each other and have a good time. Yeah. Absolutely. We'll, we'll have a good time. Trust yeah. us. Because it's not you're not just going to be playing with me yeah. as the game master. Like That's like, I facilitate fun. Yep. And yeah, like my job Find is, us, join us. And I, then you're going to be sitting at a table with like, you know, Sender or Emily or Bob or... Phil or whoever else, and we're just going to be facilitating fun. Or, or I mean, let's take you're sitting with Eric Bonds or Rob Eberzato yeah. or Brett if he's around, or you know, Ange if she's around, she'll be playing. Like those are the kind of people that are going to be sitting at these tables playing games with us. I mean, my goal when I sit down to run a game is not to, it's not for <laughs> me to run, like run my shit well. It's for you to have a good time. So, um, <sighs> yeah, like. That's my job. Like my job is to entertain you. Uh huh. So I'm gonna do that. My job is really for us to all entertain each other. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's but my job as the de facto head of the table, right? Like we know that's a distributed thing. But if you're coming to sit down to a game that I organized, I'm running. Mm-hmm. I feel a responsibility that I'm gonna make sure you have a good time. Sure. Yeah. There you go. Anything else? Um, <laughs> Jerry had a classic typo. One warning: laying with MMP, you will laugh. That's, I mean, yeah. I, mean, I believe, you, you know, that should have been playing. If you hop into but, a bed with us. Like, <laughs> I mean, you've seen it. Yeah. No, maybe some of you haven't. I mean, I don't think that bed episode exists on YouTube anywhere. Or anything. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. This is the picture. Uh, all right. We should move on to the next piece. We'll all right. save some of this other stuff for the Yeah, we we'll talk about it in the after show. Here we go. Hey, it's the Social Media Depository. Um, new product and Kickstarter alert. So first off, beating the story. Yeah, Robin Law has finally released that book that's the follow-up to uh, Hamlet Tip Points. It is, yeah. I mean, uh, Bob, do you have it up? Uh, I do not. No, I'm I'll pull it up. Strange enough, I can do that. And when I when I do, I will, uh, yeah, well, that's true. Jerry did lay with me in a room. Um, that's, um, yeah, <laughs> I'll, we'll talk about that story well, later. Well, now Jerry Anyways. and I are Eskimo brothers. There we go. <laughs> 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 Uh, oh. We didn't lay in a bed together. I mean, maybe we'll fix that at some point. Um, anyways, how to map, understand, and elevate any narrative? Beating the story by Robin Laws. The most compelling stories move us emotionally up and down between hope and fear in ways we don't always expect. But you can harness, but that you can harness as a writer, editor, and critic. This book shows you how to track, map, and understand the rhythm of a story. Whether you're writing or rewriting, editing a manuscript, or dismantling your favorite television episode, beating the story helps you understand how stories get hammered into shape. I am going to buy this and read the shit out of this, and we're going to talk about it. (laughs) I am going to buy this and read the shit out of this. Like, yeah. 
I mean, as soon as I saw it, I um, retweeted it in a bunch of places. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, what's th- I mean, what the hell else can we say, man? It's Robin Laws. Like, it, this book will be good. It'll be great, and it'll yeah, well, be one of those ones you're going to put on your shelf next to Hamlet hit points and all those other things that I right wrote. next to Hamlet hit points <laughs> and never unprepared. <laughs> Thank you, focal point. Hey, um, um, hey, um, Phil. Phil, there's a Kickstarter going on right now. Uh huh. It's a uh, it's Fate Dice and Fate Points accessories for Fate Core. Fate Core. Oh yeah, no. I'm uh, I'm intrigued. Um, I, I gotta say, I didn't jump I didn't jump immediately on this for a couple things. One, <laughs> um, I have a metric fuck ton of Fate Dice because I like bought like every yeah. other set. And you've got the campaign coin version of the Plus, Fate Points, right? I have two runs of campaign coins. Yeah. I have the regular ones, and then I had the dark ones. Yeah. So. I also have like two pounds of fate coins. <laughs> Although I will say the the prototypes that they showed for the um for the um the fate tokens they they do look kind of badass. And you get thirty of them. Yeah, and there's a Dresden Files one. Is there or is that? And it's not out yet, but I think it's a stretch goal. There's I, two. I would hope it is because well, there's so far um, the stretch goals that are announced that are still locked. The accelerated core dice three pack. Um, the accelerated core blue fate points, the infernal dice. I want the infernal dice so bad. The infernal dice look pretty badass. The emerald dice, and then there's two more stretch goals that are hidden. Yeah. Um, they better be dressed. You know, at least points. one of those has to be fate points. They got to be dressed because in piles they, fate points. They should be. One if they're not, they hit fi- they hit fifty percent in uh, in their first day. Yeah. So they hit six thousand of their twelve their uh, twelve five goal. Yeah, let's it, let's it, face not the facts. first day in like the first this, twelve hours. This is evil hat. It'll hit. This Kickstarter oh, is A, going to fund, B, and it's going to uh, unlock a bunch of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's Absolutely. It's going to do well. I, I, I do have to say, though, um, my normal reaction of, like, holy shit, I'm going to pull the trigger on this, is tempered only because... Well, you have the campaign coins. And, and like I said, yeah. I have, like, a box of... Yeah. I have a box of the new Fate dice. Like, oh. when, I, like when, when I go to play Fate with people, or run Fate with people, I bring, like, five sets of dice. Like... You don't. You don't have any. No problem. Borrow these. Yeah. The, the real reason that I put it in there is because the video is hilarious. I have not watched the video. The yeah, video has some funny stuff yeah. going on it. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm listen. They're, they're aiming right at people who are like, you have a dice obsession problem, right? <laughs> I mean, listen. Whether I back the Kickstarter or not, at some point, I'll probably have all this shit. Um, and I like their fate dice. Like I, the sets I have from the original Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. Are are awesome. So here's the thing I want to throw out there. Um, yeah. I'm not sure it'll fun, but I really wanted to because I like stuff like this. Uh, retro Future Issue 2. So Brennan Taylor, he sometimes does a uh, this Retro Future magazine. Mm-hmm. It is a pulp um, magazine that searches for diverse, surprising, and progressive science fiction in art, verse, prose, essays, and comics. Mm. So that's the kind of thing it is. Um, it's got only, by the time you hear this, there's only going to be like two days left, so... I mean, I mean, it's not it's not anywhere near its funding goal. Ooh, unfortunately, it's, it's at like four seventy of twenty five hundred. Mm. But I no, think it's, it's I think it's pretty cool. Like uh, these are these are kind of projects that I like to to look at at times and, and talk about. I'm interested in what his um, what the strategy was of um, going Kickstarter over Patreon. Maybe so he didn't have to constantly do it. That's possible because this. Yeah, I mean. I mean, maybe this is bigger. Maybe this is bigger than what you would put out in a Patreon or something like you know, like yeah. when they do Codex or something like that. Because this sounds, um, this sounds really good, and the list of people um, listed in it sounds really good. And I'll be honest, I'm kind of not backing too many Kickstarters right now because I'm saving up. Um, one, I'm heading out to Genghis Khan mm-hmm. in Denver, but then following in March, we're going to Breakout, so I'm kind of holding on to my cash a little until the spring. Um, just so that I have enough, you know, I have enough buckage to get t- to my cons. But this does look good. Oh, I, if it doesn't go, I hope it comes back in another form or something. Yeah, me too. I like Brendan Taylor too. I've met him a couple times. Yeah, he's a nice had guy. A couple cons, nice guy. All right, well that's our episode, except for some Patreon shoutouts, which I'm going to do right now. Scott Robinson, Kevin Lovecraft, James Sweetland, Jem Pixelscapes, Gange, uh, JG Lanza, and I wanted to mention a couple of the court members. Uh, Steve Farrell, the Knight of Layers. GM Gerrymander, the Lord of the After Show. Whoa, that's a that's an important title. I know, right? Uh, Eric Bontz, the Duke of Gators, of course, of course, yes. of course, and uh, Sean Gilgore, the Edge of All Knights or the Knight of All Edges. I think it works either way. Yeah, the so. Edge of All Knights. Yeah, yeah the Knight yeah. of All Edges. There we go. Uh, thank you all so much for being our patrons. And uh, those last people, remember, if you're a ten dollar a month uh, or more patron, aside from getting all of the other goodies that you get for doing that, you get a uh, title. So we give titles now. 
we can do that for some reason. I don't know why. We have our own little kingdom. Yeah, we, you know, because we saw. Oh, we'll get you in there, Mole. <laughs> and Motusino. I'm just going to give Motusino a patron shout out. Why not? I'll just <laughs> the do that. Canadian God of Gaming. The Canadian God yeah. of Gaming. He had his own title before he, yeah, he um, did. He had a title before he had a title. He's also like, before he became a patron, he was like an honorary patron. This is all because he runs the tabletop uh, podcasts um, uh, community, and that's been hugely important for Misdirected Mark and growing the brand. So mm. there's that. Uh, he does come with his own title. Uh, it says uh, it says Eric Farmer. So thank you very much. All right, anything else in the chat room before we get out of here? Yeah, actually, uh, let's do just a couple of quick ones. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um, Jared Rasher said, what's the Patreon goal for getting a chance to lie with the crew? So, <laughs> well, now. well, I guess I'll put in a $25 level. So if you pay $25, you can come and cuddle with us for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, a, a month? I mean, that's... The... Yeah, pretty much. Sure. Come on out. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, bank it and save it all up for Origins or something. Yeah, like... right? <laughs> Be like those cuddle parlors in in Tokyo, right? I guarantee. I guess I guess some of those are actually going on in, in New York City these I, days. I guarantee you won't stay awake if I cuddle you. I'm like super cuddly. Like you will fall asleep. I almost did that one night. Uh huh. Yeah. There you go. Soup. You will. You will fall. You will fall asleep. I'm mm-hmm. super. I'm super comfortable. He's he's like this big giant dude that just is kind of warm and snuggly. Yeah, and not you know soft, softish, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. Oh man! So when's the live bed episode? Uh, live bed. <laughs> You know what would be awesome? Hmm. Okay, hear me out. You realize I have a sleeper sofa in my living room. No, no, I know. But hear me out. What if we just brought a, a queen-size air mattress to Origins and just... <laughs> and, and just some sheets and a couple of pillows. And just for the, and for the actual, um, the actual uh, seminar for Misdirected Mark. The Misdirected Mark uh, Play Better Games, damn it. We just seminar. blow up the mattress and then we just sit on the mattress and do the whole and do the whole seminar instead of from the table. We just do it on the mattress. But the then we have to put everybody in the bed, which is fine. I mean, we can rotate people in and out. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. Yeah, like when you have to ask a question, one of us will get out and then somebody could get in, ask their question. And then a lucky audience member can come and, and sit in the bed with us. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> this is fucking ridiculous. Mo says, Mo says $5 a mattress I, I, I feel like Origins will. I feel like Origins will be mad at us if we are are doing that. Oh man! I feel like Origins will be like, "This is skirting yep. all of our policies." <laughs> it's what Origins will be like. I can't prove this is wrong, <laughs> but I'm sensing there's something not. There's right gotta about. be. I mean, it's all consensual, right? I yeah. mean, yeah, it's, it's gotta it's be all consensual. consensual. Like nobody has to do it. Yeah, yeah. No, of course nobody has to do it. I mean, in the absence of that, I sit in the bed with Chris. There you go. <laughs> There's some good stuff in there. Rob oh, Rob Eberzato, yeah. patron level X guest host the show. Patron level Y guest host a bet episode. There you Oof. go. Oh man. All right. Well, yeah, everyone, we thank you so much for show. listening. Uh if you are free Tuesday evenings, 8 45 p.m. Eastern, 6 45 p.m. the Queen's time. Come join us live on Twitch. Uh enter our amazing <laughs> chat room for life. Uh, be ridiculous and hilarious and make Chris laugh. And occasionally ask us a few questions. About what's going on in the show. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, if you cannot make it to the live show, check out our podcast each week wherever you get your podcast and take a listen to the other shows in the Misdirected Mark Network, such as Down with the ND, Threats from Galfrey, Vanish, Insight, Panda, Talking Game, Server Speaker, Darts, and Droid the Gnome Cast, The Wee Pause, and Hobbs and Friends of the OSR. Oh, yeah, and Jang Yu Hustle. And if you, you, you can and should also check out some of our brother and sister podcasts, she's a super geek, the Knights of the Night, and the always amazing Gaming MBS. Then, after you have uh, cuddled up with us in bed, Ask us, um, ask us some questions. Leave us some feedback. You can reach us on email directly. Chris at misdirectedmark.com. That's me. Phil at misdirectedmark.com. That's Bob at misdirectedmark.com. Check out our Facebook group. Hit us up on Twitter. The show and the network are both under at misdirectedmark. I'm at DNA Phil. He's at Robert M. Everson. And as always, Chris is at The Light 101. Where you can get your smooth jazz, postmodern jukebox, and other kinds of music on, um, uh, you know, like once a week. There you go. And, and then, of course, thanks. I was just getting there. <laughs> and then, of course, please uh, check out the, I don't know, the king size mattress of our social media <laughs> empire, our Ta-da. G Plus community. Oh, my yes. Lord. The show is going in such a <laughs> bad hey, direction. If you like end. what we do here and on the other shows in the Misdirected Mark Network, you can support our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash MMP. Patrons get access to the after show, pre-production show notes, musical parodies, the Pandas Talking Games bonus outtakes, and other special releases. 
Well, with that, this has been a misdirected Mark production, which is the media arm of Encoded Designs, which is not the cybernetic arm of Phil Vecchione, but could be. Mic drop. Oh, we out. Oh, he punched it with the left hand. <laughs> oh. <laughs>